It got really quiet, so I guess we're starting. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody. I'm Ann Elgood. I am the executive director here at ICA LA, and I'm really just wanted to welcome you all for being here. This is the first in-person public program we have done in about a year and a half, so um, it's especially exciting. <laughs> It feels good to gather with actual human beings in a space and talk and talk about art and be together. It's such a great community that always gathers around Ron. We had a beautiful opening for Ron um, whenever that was, about 10 days ago. It was fantastic. And that was also just felt like a real milestone in all of this that we've all been experiencing uh, this last year and a half or so. But I want to congratulate Ron on such a powerful, incredible exhibition. We are absolutely honored and thrilled to be presenting it here at ICLA. There you are. And I want to also congratulate Amelia Jones for her expert curatorial work. Yes. And, <laughs> and, you know, deep devotion and belief and knowledge about Ron's work. We all know, everyone in this room knows how hard it is to present performance art in a museum. So I think that she really took it on in a, in a highly intelligent, as everything she does, way. And it's, there's so much. I hope that if you haven't seen the show yet, please come in and see it in detail. If you have seen the show, please come back. It's an exhibition you can spend a lot of time with. I also want to point out the Kenneth Tam project in our project room, which is a really excellent um, double channel video that I encourage you to, to view as well. So I just want to welcome Lisa and Andy too, and thank you for being here. I'm so excited for this conversation. I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa to take it from here. I have two things to say first. One is, could, is it possible to turn that down? Because I think it's, yeah. And the other is just how incredibly excited I am to be here to celebrate these books, but also to have Lisa here, who's like the perfect person, I think, for, from Andy's and my point of view. Um, I could say a lot of things about Lisa, but one thing you need to do is see her exquisite portrait of Ron in the back mm -hmm. of the show. And uh, she's also an amazing novelist. She's also an editor. <laughs> and she has the coolest outfit on the three of us. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I'm so honored to be here. And you know how, I mean, I'm really going to try not to be overly emotional in, you know, as the moderator, but um, so bear with me if I do get teary or, you know, because I have known Ron for 35 years and loved and adored him as a person, as an artist, as a soul. It's a timeless, it's a throughout time relationship. And here I am with these brilliant thinkers and who I've come to love through Ron. And so right now I'm gonna be a traditionalist and I'm gonna read their <laughs> bios so that I don't, you know, go on and on emotionally. So Amelia Jones is a Robert A. Day professor and vice dean of academics and research in Roski School of Art and Design, USC. Recent publications include Seeing Differently, A History and Theory of Identification and the Visual Arts, Otherwise, Imagining Queer Feminist Art Histories, co-edited with Aaron Silver, The Catalog Queer Communion, Ron Athey, co-edited with Andy Campbell, and which accompanies a retrospective of Athey's work at Participant Inc. New York and here at the ICA Los Angeles and has just been listed among the best art books of 2020 in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Her book entitled In Between Subjects is a critical genealogy of queer performance and is published this year, 2021, by Rootless Press. Root Ledge Press. Andy Campbell, Associate Professor of Critical Studies, is an art historian, critic, and curator whose work foregrounds LGBTQ communities and their archives 
as well springs for histories of art and design. In addition to the edited volume that is the occasion for this program, he is the author of Bound Together, Leather, Sex, Archives, and Contemporary Art, and Queer X Design, 50 Years of Signs, Symbols, Banners, Logos, and Graphic Art of LGBTQ. In November of 2020, he co-curated with Patty Chang, Live Artists Live 3, Despair Repair, a biennial performance art program dedicated to examining catastrophe and healing in the roiling context of the 2020 US election and the ongoing pandemic. His criticism in academic writing can be found in Art Forum, The Invisible Archive, Extra, GLQ, Dress, Aperture, and other venues. Recently, he was named a Design Inquiry Fellow and during the summer of 2022, he will serve as a curator of the famed Art Pace International Artist in Residence Program in San Antonio, Texas. And he lives in Long Beach, California. <laughs> and now... I do. And he will talk about Bound Together. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I can start off. Um, so thank you all for being here um, today. Um, in light of what Anne had just said, this being the first public program especially, it is really special um, to be here with you all. So I want to um, just introduce Bound Together and kind of the questions that animated it when I first started working towards it. Um, it was my graduate school dissertation, right, turned into first academic book, and it shifted a lot kind of during that time, but the questions that undergirded it as graduate work kind of continued to do so as it um, became a book. Um, so, you know, really it's about a relationship or a, a proposed kind of relationship between contemporary practice and archival, um, archival practices kind of broadly considered. Um, so it's a, it, it came out of a couple of different places. One is noting in the, you know, late, I guess, or late aughts, you know, 20, 2007, 2008, that there were a lot, there seemed to be a lot of queer artists who were kind of plumbing archival sources and repositories and kind of making new work out of that. And I kind of wanted to understand what that was and what that relationship was. And then the other, the other source of its inspiration was um, I had done my earlier master's work on um, a really wonderful and awful um, film which is based on a book by Gore Vidal called Myra Breckenridge and um, there's a scene at the in the kind of apex of that movie where um, Myra Breckenridge kind of rapes an acting student um, and there's a lot of like BDSM kind of language to that um, rape and I didn't understand how to kind of talk about that or parse that and so as I was trying to figure out what that was, um, I wanted to find more resources about BDSM and about leather, and I was really running into walls. I mean, nothing about a kind of academic training obviously prepares you to kind of go searching for BDSM material. I mean, you can't go to the library and look up Drummer Magazine, except for when you can, right? So it's like, so where does that, where does that happen? And that was the question, right? Like, where do the archives of leather knowledge and history really live? Like, where do they exist? And to try to get to that question was really the primary aim of the book, too. So it was, on the one hand, thinking about contemporary practice, and on the other hand, thinking about kind of what are the repositories of leather knowledge kind of broadly conceived. So the book is kind of divided into lots of chapters, but just to give you some sense of um, kind of the various archives that I talk about and the various artists I talk about, sometimes they're paired within chapters, sometimes they're given their own space as chapters. Um, and it's really just a kind of extended consideration of these kind of basic questions. So what I want to do for you is highlight three of those archives that I, um, that, uh, I wrote the book out from. Um, starting from my first, um, the first bits of research that I did on this to the very last um, uh, writing that I did um, for this book. Um, so the first place that I went to, or one of the first places I went to, was the Leather Archive and Museum in Chicago, um, Illinois. So, um, so the Leather Archives and Museum is a community-based archive that was um, started essentially out of 
um, as a byproduct of the death of a, a man named Dom Orehudos, who was a really famous leather artist named Etienne. Um, and he had just died, and his lover, Chuck Renslow, who had been a very well-known and kind of well-respected and also controversial, you know, like just public person in Chicago, um, decided along with a few other folks to create a kind of archive and museum kind of with that collection of stuff um, and kind of gathering leather stuff from all over um, the United States at first and then it became a more international archive to the extent that it is um, an international archive. Um, I was a young graduate student. I was in Chicago for the summer. I had gotten a fellowship to be there. Um, I was living as cheaply as I could in a converted apartment gallery, which in, during the day um, had art and people in it. And then at night, I brought in a blow-up mattress and lived in the, in the gallery and kind of went down to um, the Leather Archives and Museum. And I struck this deal with the, um, with the director at the time uh, I said, you know, I will. Uh, I would love to have kind of access to whatever is here, but I want it. I want this to feel like a kind of more even exchange. And so, how about we divide my day in half, and you can make use of me however you want in the first part of the day, and then the second part of the day, I'll actually do my research. And so, what ended up happening is they just kind of gave me the keys to the archives and said all right, you're gonna be collections processing. <laughs> you know, you're gonna be kind of putting things into folders, kind of finding where they go. And I'm telling you that was kind of the best crash course through the material of the archive is I got to know more about that place during those hours than during my nominal working hours kind of as, um, as you know, doing research or whatever. Um, and one of the things that I started to do is just keep running lists, little running lists of like odd, assortments of things that I was kind of running across. And one of those lists was dedicated to the color yellow because I had found a lot of hanky codes and I was like, what happens if I just like take one of these colors and just like focus or put intention behind focusing on everything that kind of comes across uh, my field of vision? And that became kind of what I think is one of the more kind of experimental chapters in the book, which is to put a pretty heterogeneous array of source material from um, from clothing to newsletters, what you're seeing here at the top, uh, top middle is the um, is the Golden Showers Association newsletter. That's why there's like a bunch of people like peeing on a dude in a tub. Um, I found Popper's advertisements. Um, Rush, of course, has a red and yellow colorway that was meant to, in some ways. Um, kind of parody Superman. They had a kind of animated Superman figure um, that was kind of their, their, um, their I guess, logo. Um, all kinds of graphic art that really uh, talked about what the color yellow in the hanky code was for, which was for, it stood for golden showers, right? It stood for the erotic act of like urinating or using urine in some way, kind of in the scene of sex, right? Um, and so uh, I gathered all these yellow things together and it told this incredible story of, of things moving in and with and through the body. So from poppers that are inhaled to beer all the way through to piss. And so it kind of drew, it drew a path through the body in a way that I found really kind of productive and thought and, and interesting. Um, and so, um, I was also thinking about kind of the various contemporary artists that I wanted to be talking about, and one that stood out to me um, was Dean Samashima, um, who had done this kind of incredible se sequence of numbers paintings where he takes these um, erotic dot um, activities that appeared in Drummer Magazine, which is like the kind of, one of the preeminent kind of leather magazines of the late 1970s, early 1980s, continued up until fairly recently and, and very recently, it just got kind of re, restarted again. Um, but he had color coded his paintings according to the Henke code. So a lot of the paintings titles had, uh, they reflected the language of some Henke codes. So, um, so I put all the yellow things together and then I wrote a chapter about the yellow painting in Dean Samashima's um, numbers painting sequence, which is the one that you see here, which layers two of these erotic dot um, activities and kind of makes it impossible to tell kind of what in fact is going on. 
and he's also a big fan of John Rashi and of the book Numbers, um, which was his kind of critical follow-up to City of Night. Um, and so there's a lot here about kind of cruising, about being a number, about counting numbers, about um, integers of sex. You know, um, it's a really kind of remarkable body of work. So that's yeah. kind of how I started to situate the project. Was like, okay, archive art, archive art, and sometimes that loop kind of double backed on itself. Um, the second archival institution that I visited that really had a powerful effect on the book and its writing was um, an archive that, that is itinerant. Um, so it doesn't, it, it has a home for most of the year, but it's activated in, a, in an itinerant way. So um, the person that you're seeing up on the photograph on the top left, um, who's kind of staring at the camera, who has the long rat tail, um, actually that rat tail is super important. She auctions it off um, later in her life um, uh, to uh, support the leather archives and museums. So there's already productive kind of interplay between ar these archival institutions. Um, sh her name is Vi Johnson, and she, along with her part partner, um, Jill Carter, who's, who's standing with her back to us, actually, you can see Jill's back, um, started to collect all this material. They actually used eBay to collect most of it. Um, and they kind of bought it up whenever they saw it appearing and they just kind of aggregated this incredible collection of broadly pansexual kink material which they bring out to leather conferences and events across the United States and set up on a kind of weekend basis in like, in like hotel ballrooms and stuff. Like it's really quite amazing. They bring with them their kind of extended queer family, almost all of whom are POC, and they pack up the van with all this stuff and they bring it out to these events. And whereas these events usually have play spaces and demos and markets, like this was the one place for like knowledge acquisition and learning and kind of historical telling. Um, and she's just a really kind of wonderful and lovely person. If anybody ever, here ever gets to be in or around Vi's vicinity, I would highly recommend it. She, I was, again, I was like a very poor young graduate student and she had finagled it so that I could get into this very expensive leather conference for like minimal dollars. And as soon as I got there, she like found me because I was like the nerd wearing glasses and not a harness. And she, and she just found me and gave me this like huge hug and was like, how, how can we help this project, you know? And it was like this moment of like extreme validation. So whenever I talk about Vi, I'm kind of, it, it's also a kind of emotional, yeah, it's also an emotional beginning to the relationship. And, and she had this really fascinating object that she carries around with her, which is this leather pinch sash. She's actually wearing it in the photograph that you see above. And she um, got the idea to make a leather pin sash um, uh, from her days as a Girl Scout in um, Rissell, New Jersey, um, which, uh, and, and I'll tell you a funny story. So this is an illustration that appears in the 1955 Intermediate Handbook of the Girl Scouts of America uh, handbook, right? And um, I wanted to reproduce this in the book to talk about her early days as a Girl Scout and how adherence to uniform was actually something that was a through line in her life, actually. Um, and the Girl Scouts, of, I was so nervous about approaching the Girl Scouts of America to give permission for a book called Bound Together Leather, Sex, Archives, and Contemporary Art. Did not bat a fucking eye. The Girl Scouts are the coolest. And they gave me, and they gave me full permission and they were like, we're into it, we can't wait. Send us a copy. Um, so I, I love the Girl Scouts of America. Um, but she, yeah, <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know, kink comes from lots of places. Um, uh, and so she, she built this incredible pin sash of pins that both she had been given, that she had, had pinned on her, but also that she had collected. And so I did a reading of some of the pins on her pin sash, including this one at the very end, um, which she keeps in a separate box because it's kind of special to her. And it says the LAPD freed the slaves. Um, April 10th, 1976, and it's from an event where the LAPD, which was then being run by Ed Davis, who believed that you could um, virally transmit homosexuality, um, uh, he spent about $100,000 equivalent in our dollars today to raid a 
um, charity slave auction at the Mark IV bathhouse, arresting at first about 40 people and then fully trying four people. And so what this button is, is it's essentially the community response to that action. Um, so it is making fun of the police. It is um, kind of using the kind of emancipatory language that the police used in their bust against them and kind of also leveraging some of the kind of um, the, the overt and undercurrents of kind of leather language of master slave of um, those historical traumas kind of against the LAPD at that particular point. So um, we talked about the button, we talked about all, a lot of her pins and that was kind of really um, fabulous and, and, um, and I compare this in some ways to Naylan Blake um, and to his performance um, which he made for his 2012 Yerba Buena Center for the Art Show called Free Love Toolbox. And of course, the ICA just hosted Nalen's um, survey um, as well. So some of these pieces were actually just here, like less than a year or less than two years ago. Um, but what I was really kind of focusing on was this kind of repainted mural that Nalen Blake makes of a mural that appeared in the toolbox, which was one of the earliest essentially leather bars um, essentially in San Francisco, it gets destroyed. Um, it's a mural by a leather artist named Chuck Arnett and he repaints it and then attaches these ribbons to it and then he, in a ritualistic kind of piercing performance, kind of has the audience attach the ribbons that are attached to the mural to his body and then actually kind of starts to push the boundary of how far his body can stretch with the attachment to this kind of historical thing, right? Um, and I just found that to be an interesting way of talking about attachment, just like emotional attachment and effective attachment, but also, of course, literal attachment to history. And then the last archive um, and the last piece of writing that I did for the book um, actually um, comes out of being asked by um, David Franz, who's here as well, um, to write for the catalog um, for a show of the work of D. Cronkin, which is um, an artist collective um, that is um, that is composed of Jonesy, who is right here, and Jamie Knight, Jamie C. Knight, um, and Luke Munson is another kind of member that pops in and out, and um, and the show was looking at um, you know the work that um, David was doing at the one was really it was something that I was aware of before I arrived in LA because he was one of the few curators working in an archival context that really invited like artists to look at the archive in critical ways and make something kind of new out of it and, and whether or not that was kind of ultimately generative for the institution or not was not really the point. It was really about kind of this process of making and kind of finding the wellspring for making and um, that was certainly the case with this show. Um, De Cronkin was looking at the Blue Max MC papers and the Blue Max was a motorcycle club in Southern California. And a lot of early leather culture comes out of the motorcycle club. So in some ways, the last thing that I wrote returned me to the earliest origins of leather cultures in the United States. And what they produced was this really incredible, well, they produced a suite of, of works, um, some of which kind of made use of this character of the nurse, which is like this kind of character, this caretaking character, healing character, one who looks after history, who acknowledges history in some way. Um, but they made this really incredible video um, that referenced a, the Blue Max MC would, um, on runs, which were, so much of this culture, you have to like kind of, <laughs> you have to kind of explain all the context, but on runs, you would, um, you'd kind of essentially ride out with your club brethren out to the middle of nowhere, camp out, and over a weekend have, you know, activities, races, fucking, like everything, you know, everything would happen out there. And um, one of the things that they did was put on um, an awards ceremony or kind of pageant, but then they would also put on this play that they called The Rose of No Man's Land, which was essentially a variety show, which was essentially ha like they dressed up a lot of a lot of the acts were dressing up in drag and lip syncing, um, and, uh, and it would be the same story every time, and it was the story about a World War I nurse in no man's land picking up a body and kind of taking it back. And that's important because the Blue Max MC took their signia and their kind of inspiration from Kaiser Wilhelm II from World War I. So it's this like 
it's this insane like rereading of World War I by a bunch of men, some of whom were World War II veterans, um, and kind of reproducing that as a variety show that featured drag and lip syncing at a kind of leather super butch kind of event. I mean, it's like the layers of it were quite incredible. And so what um, De Kronken did was they created this kind of video approximation or um, or a rethinking through of this kind of performance that would happen yearly and would be given different glosses. And it's just this incredible, um, it's this incredible performance. It begins with this very masterpiece theater moment of Jonesy, um, sit at, Master Jonesy, you can see him uh, up there um, with his table, with his sub table, um, who he is kind of setting up the, he's setting up the, the video and he's also kind of smacking his table every now and then and his table kind of moves in response. Um, it's, it's this really kind of wonderful um, way through that material. So for me, that was, that was kind of the end piece of, I, that was kind of the part that was the thing that I knew the book was done when I wrote it. It was like, this is, the, this is the last component that was needed. And so what you can tell by those three archives is that one is dedicated to leather expressly, one is kind of seemingly ad hoc or itinerant, and one is actually a broader LGBTQ archive that includes leather material but is not solely dedicated to that. So that gives a sense of range as to where kind of leather history exists and kind of how it gets used by contemporary artists. So I should stop there. Um, I could talk all evening about it. Um, and I'll pass it to you. Pass me the phallic device. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. I'm not yeah. sure I'll be able to see, but I'll try. Um, so this book, as I was hearing you talk, I was like, this is kind of the opposite because it's a study of discourse. It's not that I never looked at archives, because I did actually, but it's primarily about how queer theory and performance theory have been written and why it is that at a certain point in the 1990s they start to dovetail so that by the early 2000s there's this kind of nonchalant idea of queer performance or of things being performative and queer. And I'm the kind of person when that starts to happen, I start to question why. You know, why are we just assuming those things go together? So, um, yeah, the book, it, you know, it's a long process. It, I started thinking about doing it about 15 years ago when I, early on when I had moved to the UK and it was, you know, British people being British people, they're very good at letting you know when something is provincial. And so Ron knows what I'm talking about. Um, which, you know, I actually agreed with them that I was able to start to see how specific this discourse was and that it really was so specific that it was not only primarily US, but it was actually kind of urban, white people in the US developing a particular idea of queer and a particular idea of performance. So I was working on other projects at the time, but it started to percolate. And then eventually I also lived in Canada where I had kind of a whole other view being in Montreal of what the specificity of that, not just North American, but actually mostly US discourse. And then I got a Fulbright to go to New Zealand, and that was kind of the third Anglo Commonwealth uh, kind of experience, seeing how certain ideas of queer and performance had permeated there, but also how there's a lot of resistance, rightly so, especially among the Maori and Pacifica communities. So that kind of provided the final justification for um, what ended up being a really simple organization of chapters because I started to realize there were certain concepts that dominated at certain moments. So it's kind of vaguely chronological, but there's a lot of looping back and forth. Um, starts with performativity, uh, there's a prologue where I deal with some, just some of my favorite performances <laughs> by people like Castles and uh, Sandri Barra, 
and Julie Tolentino, who's also present in this show, um, and an introduction where I kind of raised this issue of why, why this happened, why these discourses came together. And the easiest like pocketbook explanation is Judith Butler's gender trouble, right? <laughs> that she wrote this book, came out around 1990, and it talked about gender as a performance, and then um, actually in 1993, she wrote another book following up on that called Bodies That Matter that had a chapter on Paris's burning. And between those two books, um, even though most people wouldn't have read them, there becomes this kind of popularized discourse around queer performance, queer performativity, to the point where I was just enjoying finding more and more ridiculous <laughs> examples. I mean, you know, an episode of RuPaul, mm -hmm. um, you know, when the New Yorker does a profile and acts as if this is like common cultural knowledge, you know mm -hmm. that, you know, you've gone too far. Um, <laughs> and then, so the chapter on performativity is literally this moment where the idea of the performative is invented by the linguistic philosopher J.L. Austin in a series of lectures in the 1950s. So it's actually a rare case where, you know, something does have an origin, but the concept of performativity was kind of a broader idea, and I started to read a lot of social science that was kind of elaborating, usually through different language, this idea of um, the way people in the social realm interact in ways that take place over time and that even as individuals we have meaning that accrues over time, which is kind of what ended up being thought of as the performative. Also related to the social science concept of the relational. So those two things kind of overlap and then you move into the late 50s and 60s where um, the sociologist Irving Goffman famously wrote about social performance in 1956. And that starts getting taken up by a range of social scientific discourse. Again, it becomes super popularized so that you start to see, you know, in Life magazine, this idea of social performance or people engaging each other in social settings and kind of not just influencing each other but actually kind of shaping each other. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a weird chapter because you can see some of the artworks that I use to kind of propel the argument or to um, disrupt the more academic argument including here, Ron's incredible, incorruptible flesh piece, which is also in the show. Um, but I also ran into my father's work in this chapter, and so that was like a really weird moment where I realized I was like channeling the dinner table conversation from when I was a kid. Um, you know, you think you're so original and that you've like created this world that your parents could never understand and then you realize you're basically just repeating mm -hmm. their research. Mm -hmm. So he was a social psychologist and they called it interpersonal perception. But it was actually very much kind of an expansion um, on the Goffman idea. And I realized that the reason I'm so interested in that is I was literally raised on it. So mm -hmm. I had this uncomfortable moment where I ran into one of my father's books, which starts with an anecdote about me in college and my roommate. And then I'm like, oh, you know, God, I'm like, I'm literally writing about myself. Um, which you're always doing, right? But it's weird when you realize how personal yeah. everything is. And then theatricality is, of course, goes back, you know, thousands of years, but it becomes like this insistent trope that gets picked up in the 60s and gets attached to gay men. And even the illustrious co-founder of performance studies, Richard Schechner, actually wrote a homophobic screed in the early 60s about how the New York theater was too theatrical and too gay. And so this was like a really common kind of trope. And so those of you who read art history will know the infamous Michael Fried. 
excoriating the theatricality of minimalism, which like undergraduates are always like, why is this guy so upset about these like <laughs> pieces of metal, you know, <laughs> on the floor? And I've always taught that essay as like implicitly misogynistic and homophobic. But lo and behold, an art historian, Krista Robbins, found a letter from Michael Fried written to the editor of Art Forum where that article was first published in 1967. And in the letter, he basically uh, damns the minimalists as having a faggot sensibility. So it actually is, like all those years, I thought it was implicit, yeah. but it's actually yeah. just plain old homophobia. Yeah. So it's, it's really there. It's like really present in the 60s. And understanding that negative discourse is a great way of understanding how it is that, you know, queers and feminists and so on then kind of leapt to borrow theatricality and refashion it as a radical challenge to those masculinist discourses. Um, so this is a pretty long chapter and I do, I address a lot of different historical cases including Sylvester um, who, li who lived right down the street from here, who um, I couldn't believe this, but he hung out with a bunch of anatomically male uh, friends who would cross dress and go to parties with at Etta James's house. You know, it was like, this stuff is so, you couldn't make it up. It's so <laughs> exciting. And that's like a whole subculture in LA that then threads its way through to Jules Catch One because the Mighty Real video is actually filmed in Jules Catch One which is the wonderful queer black disco, where I myself went in the early 90s, and then that opens the door to my concept of queer community that we see in Ron's show. On um, the queer chapter, I just go deeply into Judith Butler's concept, but also Eve Sedgwick and a number of different um, theorists and try to understand how queer gets attached so directly to this idea of the performative. And again, there's many historical examples that kind of um, open that up. The last two chapters um, were really transformed when I went to New Zealand with uh, Paul right mm -hmm. here, who's a New Zealander. Um, and it was a bit of a stretch arguing to the Fulbright that I absolutely had to be in New Zealand to write this book on queer performance, mm -hmm. but somehow it worked. And lo and behold, it actually really changed the book because by the end I was drawing on certain Maori concepts of genealogy to rethink my own relationship to whiteness and to queer theory and so on. Um, so I go deep into this whole uh, colonialist background of my own family and the way in which white privilege often plays out, especially in our worlds, as uh, educational privilege. And it's something that I feel like we haven't really thought about enough that you may not, like my family has never had a lot of money, but we've always been highly privileged educationally. It's a big part of how we've had cultural space. Um, and then the final chapter is trans and um, it kind of leans more towards the engagements I had with Maori and indigenous and, and Pacifica performance, which you see in the middle, Akashi, who's the um, chanter for a group called Fast Swag, which I ended up kind of following them around, even doing a workshop with Akashi where um, I came up against my failure to perform femininity. So I elaborate on that in the book. And also just fascinating because I would talk to them and I would, you know, do that kind of well-meaning academic thing of like, well, I don't, I don't want to impose my views on you and, you know, but does Paris is burning? Do you know that? And they're like, oh my God, you know, we watch that every week and it's <laughs> like, uh, so it was like, you know, me kind of relearning what that particular part of the discourse meant in this very different context. Um, yeah, so that's it for the book. And before I completely end and we turn to queer communion, I, I just wanted to mention 
Lauren Berlant, who just died Monday. Um, and as I was glan glancing through Queer Communion and rereading Andy's book, I kept coming up against her quotations and I wanted to, in her honor and in memory, read a couple of quotations that I think actually lead perfectly to a discussion of queer communion. Um, she, with Michael Warner in Sex and Public says, quote, queer and other insurgents have long striven to cultivate what good folks used to call criminal intimacies. We have developed relations and narratives that are only recognized as intimate in queer culture. Queer culture has learned not only how to sexualize these and other relations, but also to use them as a context for witnessing intense and personal affect while elaborating a public world of belonging and transformation. Um, and then she also talks about, in Andy's book you cite this, on how sex identifies, quote, the ongoing question of how living might be structured. And actually I think it's kind of a beautiful way to think about your work, Ron. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of underlines the motivation behind the show and the catalog. Oh, yeah. So the catalog, um, I would just say that Andy saved my life. Um, I was in the you know, depths of trying to pull together the show when the Getty was coming to pull out, well, basically to take the archive from my house. I had a lot of Ron's materials in my house and I knew I had to pull out everything that might be in the show because once the Getty takes hold of something, they will not loan it. Forget it. Mm. Except maybe one or two pieces. So I was frantically doing that. And then meanwhile realizing I need to get this catalog done and you know, who do I know who's like really brilliant and knows everything about queer archives and is an amazing writer. Um, and of course my colleague, you know, so we see each other every day over at USC, so dream come true, um, and yeah, we just whipped it out. We did, and truly. Um, part, of, part, of the, part of the other motivation, and maybe this is also a place um, to address Lisa too, is that part of the conception from the very beginning was to not make it a book that was just a bunch of academics writing about an artist, but actually thinking about kind of functionally kind of what does what work does the catalog do? And one was that we wanted to publish a lot of things that you had written, Ron, um, and to like kind of republish those in a place where people could kind of find them. But the other one was to invite collaborators, people who have known you forever, um, intimates, you know, old friends, old hated enemies, I don't know, right? Like all into the fold, all into the fold, yeah, frenemies. Frenemies. Um, all into the fold um, to kind of make some remark of some kind. And of course, Lisa was part of that from the very beginning as well. And Lisa has a really beautiful essay in the catalog, which is about Ron's early years and kind of meeting Ron and kind of spending those early years together. So I don't know, how is it for you? <laughs> in this catalog, Lisa. <laughs> well, but yeah. I, I had, first I just wanted to ask yeah. how the three of you came to agreement upon how to shape the catalog, which becomes the show, and yeah. how, yeah. and you know, and who to approach. Um, I mean, you heard... I'm just laughing because like, I never asked Ron, I just <laughs> went and Oh, really? <laughs> Mm -hmm. the, the best person to work with of my life because you you're so generous and easygoing and there was the moment where we were choosing the writings mm -hmm. and we wanted to publish there's a whole bunch of never before published like very personal writings and you we we definitely made sure you looked at them first so we dragged Ron over to my house took out the box and he said, these are the ones we want to put in. And you actually only said no to, I think, two small things. Mm -hmm. So that was a thrilling moment where mm -hmm. you, I, I can't, you know, I can't say enough about how helpful it was to have you kind of just be open and let it happen, but then play a key role when I really mm -hmm. needed you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which was often. Mm -hmm. And how did you approach 
how did you approach Ron in the beginning? Like, mm -hmm. how, what's the beginning of when the story? When you started this. You know, yeah. so I that can't everyone even knows. remember. I know that I had the idea before you came back here and had the archive crisis, because I was already, and I think we just, I just presented it to you and you were kind of nodded and <laughs> said it might be interesting, but <laughs> I don't think either of us really imagined like what that meant to do a show of your work. So that just kind of happened organically over the, it's been at least eight years since it's been percolating. Hi. And you met in London, you were teaching in Manchester? And yeah, well, I knew Ron from the early 90s. So I had, um, Bob Flanagan and Sherry Rose had said, you have to see our friend Ron at Highways. And so I narcissistically, I included, when I found the flyer to that actual event in your yeah. archive, it was, those are the most exciting archival moments. You're like, I was there. I was there. there. Yeah, right. This is amazing. Right, right. Um, and so that was when I saw you perform uh, Deliverance, I think. And then, you know, we kind of saw each other off and on in the 90s, but it was, yeah, it was when I moved to the UK in 2003 and you moved in 2009. And then we saw each other in London, but I saw you perform quite a bit in London and in uh, Manchester and in Slovenia and started to really, that's when it started to percolate. A lot of people in the UK were talking about the issue of live art in history, like the whole, the whole live art development agency was really deep into that. So that was actually the first kind of inspiration was to do a show of a performance artist's career in a way that didn't just try to illustrate performances or something that honored the bigger energies behind the work. Yeah. So that was how many years ago? That was That would have been, you know, like, 2000, oh God, I guess it's like 12 years ago. 12 years. 2000, I mean, it was like 2008, 2009, yeah. And then when Ron, I moved back here in 2014 and you moved back in 2015 and then the archive had nowhere to go mm -hmm. um, because you had to move. So that's when it became real. It was right. like, I guess, I guess I really have to do this. So that now. was the gift of that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whole situation it's with like your home. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. The silver lining to be kicked, <laughs> yeah. being yes. kicked out of your rent control yes, apartment. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so then, you know, I mean, Paul and I just lived with all these objects and papers and it's like, in a way, it's like the greatest dream of a historian, but in another way, it's like terrifying because you can't get away from it. Really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's everywhere. I'm mm -hmm. um, including two of the very beautiful portraits in the back, um, the Franco B portrait, which is Ron's, and then your amazing portrait, mm -hmm. which so Paul funny. and I owned. Those were hanging in our house until this mm -hmm. install a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And is there something that you would want the audience to know about your participation in the, the creating of the book? Um, I didn't have that much to do with the book. N at all, just, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I was kept informed where, where it was going and who, who was um, writing essays. Right. Yeah. And, also, and, then, and also with the choice of your essays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which are sure. amazing. Mm -hmm. He's an amazing writer. Amazing Those of writer. you who don't yeah. know his brain, <laughs> his mind, his brain for science and history, and just you know, I mean, really, it's this isn't my bias. It's <laughs> it's um it's just a fact. <laughs> and then he knows how to use the one mind, you know, the all with his brain. So. <laughs> And I wanted to be sure, in my essay, I wanted to try and make that clear, just so that people understand. Oh my God, so I'm gonna say one thing and then you have to talk about your essay because, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. 
So I wanted to say one thing before you have to talk a little bit about that nugget of an essay where I learned something new about Ron and his capacity to decapitate mice, mice. Um, <laughs> which is that Dominic Johnson um, wrote a, well, edited kind of more of a, it's really more of an art historical book. And he, Dominic covered all the kind of taxonomy and the beautiful images and did all of that work. And I was really, I am really, really grateful because I didn't really want to do that kind of book. So, but I did go to the same press so that, and they were super excited to do this kind of very different Ron Athey book that was more about um, the living archive and the work as a kind of scrappy, like, you know, the, the writings and the sketches and the, so the book it, you will see if you look through it has hundreds of pictures. Intellect Press is the most amazing publisher if you ever have like a super complicated, crazy book. They will do it without even blinking an eye. Um, and the fact that we have this section in the begin in the sorry in the middle, middle with different paper stock with Ron's writings was really important to me. So I wanted to say that about Dominic, and now you have to talk about the the revelations <laughs> of the Lisa Teasley <laughs> view of Ron Athey. It's well, such an amazing essay. I I just I just want again everyone to know that I mean, Ron could have chosen to have been a scientist um, as well, or a writer, or just a writer, you know? Um, uh, and because the head of his household, his grandmother, uh, wanted him to be a minister, he actually had to hide the fact that he was in the gifted program and got a scholarship to the Jonas Salk Institute in San Diego. And waited as a high schooler, as a high like. schooler, as a high schooler, and had to hide this fact until the very last minute. I mean, like before, like practically getting on the bus, you know, to go to mm. San Diego. And when his grandmother heard, she just she was throwing plates at his head. But he went anyway. <laughs> you know, he went anyway. Thank God. <laughs> you know, um, and. That, so that exploration of, you know, of his scientific brain um, in uh, addition to his study of history um, and, you know, under the covers in his bedroom with a flashlight, you know, reading books twice, you know, so that he wouldn't mm. get caught reading. Mm. I mean, wouldn't get mm. caught book learning, wouldn't mm. get caught you know, enriching this incredible brain. And I'm saying this brain because I grew up with an incredible brain, my father's. Mm. And so I recognized that. And that was one of the things, I mean, there were so many reasons for me to fall in love with him, but that's a, that's a big one just because, you know, his mind, the mind. And mm -hmm. a, a mind is an incredible thing to waste, and he didn't <laughs> let that happen, thank God. So. <laughs> So I try to, um, you know, make that clear in my essay. And so. But what I love is like you, you pull out this like behavior that in my family would have been rewarded. Right. <laughs> was like you had to do this furtive intellectual thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which somehow like makes sense in terms of the rest of your career being this kind of, like what's the difference between being an intellectual and being, you know, go-go dancing in a queer club or doing BDSM performance. They're all forbidden. Um, and you really bring that out. So the essays are this kind of, there's a couple that are a little bit academic, including mm -hmm. actually Dominic's, but mm -hmm. most of them are quite personal and very particular, and we really wanted to evoke different elements so of the community. The process of pleading uh, in the blood of the Dominic Johnson edited book, um, that is where the materials came from, like finding yeah. 80s photographers. I mean, people, everyone shot on film then. Uh, there was no other way to shoot. Yeah. And to find people who weren't shooting anymore, but to beg them to go into their storage. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, like from Edward Culver, um, the No Magazine ones, the, the, there's a lot of material that didn't exist. And, That's right. Uh, also, the, 
the reach of social media, like just throwing mm -hmm. out that, like who was at Arts Building in 1982 that would have the second flyer? Who, you know, yeah. who really did call outs and relentlessly and, and almost all of it paid, I'd say they paid off 90%. Yeah, and that, that was extremely book. valuable, obviously, and Dominic just shared everything. So, and obviously you shared everything and, I mean, it points to some strange elements of doing a show like this that are going to be increasingly problematic in the future, which is that there are no hard copy photographs after the early 2000s because everyone started taking yeah. pictures with their phones. Mm -hmm. right. So you'll notice there's a slideshow of community and friends. And a lot of those, all of the more recent ones, I just dragged off of Ron's social media. So, mm -hmm. or I took them myself, actually, mm -hmm. a few of them. So, mm -hmm. like, that's a weird, I don't think we're really thinking about that enough. Like, what does that even mean? How, how are, what form are performance artists or even artists' archives going to be in, in mm -hmm. the future, if mm -hmm. nobody uses pieces of paper anymore? Right. or has photographs because most of the the material archive is like suitcases full of photographs slides you know it's like materials um, and I know one thing that's happening with archives is that for example Jose Munoz who passed away in 2013 his archive is at the fails at NYU as his laptop mm -hmm. mm. Mm -hmm. And of course, wow. that's terrifying because, mm -hmm. like, I'm thinking about all this stuff on my laptop. <laughs> um, well, but you get my that. Diary. But you get that experience when you go through like someone's bank boxes, you know, that they have uh, too. I mean, because yeah. it's like people put things in those boxes sometimes to ensure that they're around, but they kind of forget about them. And so when Ooh, they start so donating, when did you then, find something in a bank box? Well, I mean, you know, like people, people keep financial records, they keep, you know, diaries, oh, yeah. they keep things that, that, you know, there is early when you do kind of archival work or when you start doing archival work, it can feel incredibly invasive, yeah. you know, because what you're encountering... Well, especially if it's not an archive yet. Well, even when it is, right, because yeah. it's a, someone's full collection that's entered into the institution and you're sitting at a table and all of a sudden you have the number of a trick in front of your face and you're like what do I do kind of with this yeah. you know so I think there are a lot of ways in which kind of the personal comes I mean whether it's a laptop or like a box full of stuff yeah you know? but by the time it's in an archive a lot of that stuff will have been removed some at least some of the time yeah there are so some restrictions your sometimes stuff, on stuff like you yeah. and I talked about there are pa there are some papers that probably would be better Restricted. off not going to the Getty ah, right um, I certainly you know if I ever had stuff archived would feel that way but um, yeah yeah so it's I'm not bothered <laughs> Clearly, yeah. Oh, no, you, you agreed with me on these papers. I'm going to remind you about it. Yeah. But, um, but the joke is, of course, like this wasn't an archive, it was just your stuff. Right. It's only an right. archive when you had to right. move, and then right. it has to be put right. in staples bins, and it's suddenly right. an archive. You know, right. it's like, but you're like right here, and right. you're still making stuff. And one of the things I'm so excited about with this venue of the show is the living aspect of, especially as you get towards the new work, because the acephalous monster props have to be used in August when the Red Cat performance takes place. And the Possify box in the screening room, that piece isn't even finished yet, so I haven't seen it. I just know the box. So it's a really exciting opportunity to do even beyond the, what we were able to do with the catalog where some of the stuff wasn't even made yet you know, is to think about making sure that people experience the show and realize it's a living kind of changing body of work that it's not some dead reified thing um, and it's amazing to have the opportunity to do that mm -hmm. because it's not going to happen once the run of this show is finished and it all goes to the Getty. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. won't be shown again. So we should open to questions and hear from people what their experience has been, you know, seeing the show or. 
you know, anything you want to talk about the books or the <laughs> archives? <laughs> Anecdotes. Yes. Um, I, I just wanted to say one more word, which is that the Andy and I were in agreement that the catalog would be kind of a compendium to the show, but not a traditional exhibition catalog. So it, it actually came out almost a year A year ago. before. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't have a proper checklist because that was changing constantly. Right. And it's, I, this is actually, this venue is quite different from the New York venue. So it has like a, a narrative checklist at the back where I elaborate on some of the things we think will be in the show. But it's not, it's really meant to be quite uh, unusual and maverick in what it's trying to do. It's, it's a supplementary experience, really. It's almost the uh, biographical dimension of the show. As yeah, take the mic, because... Yeah. Oh, just... <laughs> Yeah, it's the catalog then is the biographical expansion of through the language of the friends of Ron, if you... Yeah, but it's not, it, thank you mm -hmm. for that, because it's not, it's also not a conventional biography, you know, there, there are elements of like, you know, one friend will have one set of memories or um, Caesar Padilla has another set that have to do with tattooing. <laughs> And then another friend, you know, so that's part of the, the bigger argument of the show and the catalog is to honor this incredible body of work and life, performative, creative life, but also the communities that, you know, you've helped to form, that you've circulated in and out of, et cetera, rather than making it just kind of a traditional monographic show, which didn't make sense to me. Hmm. Both because of the nature of your career, but also with performance, I don't know, I just, I don't see performance communities or careers as really easily fitting into that traditional format. Hmm. Um, hmm. The biography is there, but... So, um, can we talk a little bit? I think they want you to take the mic because it's being recorded, yeah. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about the archive as a living, breathing thing? Mm -hmm. Because it's, and, and is that particular in a way to the performative? I mean, I think about artists who, uh, I mean, certainly Ron has, you know, there are plenty of object, object based works in the show but they're also very much alluding to the performative mm -hmm. in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we kind of look at that, uh, how, look at archive as living and breathing yeah. in an ongoing way mm -hmm. um, and kind of across media mm -hmm. in, yeah. a, in a sense? Yeah, I mean, I mean, all I think, of your thoughts. I mean, I think one of the one of the tools that I often bring up in classes, but also in my own work, is Diana Taylor's work on the archive and the repertoire. Thinking about kind of the ways in which an archive might be embodied knowledge or passed down, kind of through um, kind of community interpersonal transmission, right? So that's a very literal kind of read on kind of what kind of what you're asking, which is like, is there a component of the archive that lives and lives on, and how does it do that? And, you know, and there's one version of that answer that that is expansive enough to incorporate oral tradition, that is expansive enough to incorporate kind of various ways of kind of passing down that knowledge that is not just the kind of like things in a room, you know, together as an archive, which is I think what most people think of when they think of kind of capital A archive, right? Mm -hmm. But the other answer to that question too, I think, you know, is that archives are repositories that are meant to be kind of activated by people. So mm -hmm. they actually are not meant to kind of sit dormant or silent, and they're always being kind of worked in and on. And especially for the people that make a life and work in archives, they are living places because they're places that like, that are always changing, whose boundaries are always being shored or amended or extended or whatever, right? So I also think a lot about kind of like the, the people that get mentioned or named as, as 
as involved in the archive rarely ever includes the people who work in the archives. And, and so I often see the folks who work in archives as a kind of also extension, a kind of living extension of some of the archival principles that they work around, right? I mean, I am sure if you scratch an academic who's done archival work that they will have a story about an archivist suggesting they check out XYZ or slipping them a book that they didn't know about or whatever, and that's because these collections live, you know, for, for those people who work inside them. So I also think about kind of the way that an archive lives is, you know, institutions are made of people and, and people are kind of always doing that work, you know? So that, those would be two ways of kind of thinking around it, I think. Oh, Andy's book has wonderful examples, too, mm -hmm. of how these archives circulate. And, but, I mean, for me, before I started working on this project, archives were always these kind of reified, closed things that you had to figure out how to get stuff out of. So, one example is years ago when I was writing about Duchamp, and I made an appointment at the Philadelphia Museum of Art to see their archives, and it just so happened that the archivist curator was gone the week I was there. Mm -hmm. And so I got to mm -hmm. see everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then she came back the last day and she said, oh my God, you didn't see all this, did you? You can't cite any of that. And it was like, yeah. are you kidding? Like, so yeah. I, now I have like this deep memory yeah of Teeny Duchamp's materials yeah. and all this like private correspondence that I, I wasn't allowed. Supposed to see, to yeah. Um, yeah, no, you're so, right, it has a disciplinary kind so of function too, obviously. So I think your examples yeah. in your book are very beautiful examples that I think are quite particular to queer communities. I was, yep, yeah, yeah. And yeah, not yeah, to yeah. the official yeah. art world where yeah. unfortunately archives become this kind of closed, frozen yeah. thing. Um, yeah. But I, I just, one more thing is that I don't know if you realize how much stuff I've saved for you in the last <laughs> like year and a half since like, oh, the art forum, you know, articles about the participant version of the show. Yeah. I bought two hard copy issues so that they can go into the archive. <laughs> so now I'm like, oh God, I'm really yeah. like inhabiting You're in it. You're in it now. <laughs> You're in it now. I'm making it worse. I'm yeah. And I have this drawer and I keep putting yeah. more stuff in there. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's going to mushroom and then you're going to have to deal with it. Yeah. Oh, they're going to make but, you take the mic. But Oh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but whatever it is, archival, museological, um, the conversation is already shifting on that with respect to transparency of mm -hmm. these kinds of uh, archiving, uh, taxonomies, um, you know, however, they're museologically uh, organized. And the other thing that I would, so that is all really sort of open up. And actually, I think the Getty is sort of, has sort of an initiatives going on with Getty Research Institute with respect to that, number one. Number two, um, with respect to that kind of taxonomy that you guys have had, you know, mm -hmm. a first-hand look at, um, is that what, I mean, I think we see both going through a show like this and generally speaking is that, is the way these things can be pulled apart mm -hmm. and reorganized and or reperformed. And of mm -hmm. course that, you know, bearing in mind that inevitably these will be reperformed. They're meant to be mm -hmm. reperformed. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, we're performing them unconsciously, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. every single day mm -hmm. um, and on one level or another. So, um, do you want to talk about that? I mean, mm -hmm. I think, I, I mean, I'm interested to, in what you, um, Amelia, mm -hmm. um, have to say about that. Um, because it is sort of like looking to the future to seeing what you know, new narratives are going to be constructed or reconstructed out of these materials, and yeah. um, so. Um, I mean, I just feel so lucky that I've known you for a while and that I saw a lot of these materials before you even, you know, had to store them somewhere. Um, and before an archivist 
rationalize them, even though I deeply respect the need to do that, but I also secretly prefer to get, you know, that access before that happens, because once that happens, then you can't pretend that you didn't see that logic that an archivist gives it. Right. So I right. feel incredibly lucky that I was just able to make whatever sense out of it after years of talking to you and kind of thinking about the show and then working with you on the book. And, you know, it just was this incredibly organic process that um, almost drove me crazy at certain <laughs> points, as Paul will testify. <laughs> but, but in the end, I'm just so excited by what we came up with and how, you know, I wanted to come up with a show that would feel exciting and energize the way Ron's work is, but not that it was somehow presenting the work or representing the work, because it can't do that. Um, it's a museum, it's a gallery, and performance can't be, um, well, it, you know, I hate to say the, you know, the bad example, but it's inevitable that I always end up mentioning Marina Abramovich. Um, <laughs> Um, but that example of like, you know, how do you display her performances and then also <laughs> even her performances that were done with Ule, it's just so weird the way those decisions were made. And I, I you know, it was an interesting show in many ways, but I didn't want to do that. And it, it wouldn't work for your work anyway. Your work right. isn't that kind of work. So, yeah, I think that I'm hoping that the show doesn't feel just like you're having access to an archive, that it actually feels more like you're having access to a, a creative life with different communities and that you're, you know, obviously not recreating it exactly, but that you have a sense of that somehow. Mm -hmm. And the book as well, you know, mm -hmm. the book I hope does that in a different way. I mean, books are books, right? Mm -hmm. they, <laughs> They function in a particular way. They're gonna la it's gonna last longer than the show. Um, it's a different thing, but I think it does that in a different way. I hope. When you're performing a cephalus monster, this the <laughs> what's here will some be of the missing, pieces, but will yeah. you put something else in its place? In its no, place. I can't yeah. wait to put the label that says this has been removed for a live performance at Red Cat. <laughs> Purchase your tickets here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's like, yeah, you know how yeah. you see when you go to the Met and there's a label and it says this right. piece has been taken for display and mm -hmm. I can't wait. I'm excited. <laughs> it's, I think that's a cool thing. You yeah. know, like this stuff is still being used and knowing you, geez, you'll probably like take the holy woman dress again or something. <laughs> every, time, every time I would think, okay, I finally get it. This prop was used in those three places. Then you would like borrow it and go use it somewhere mm -hmm. else. I'd be like, mm -hmm. no, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's in something else. It's mm -hmm. been something totally different now. I mean, it's a perfect example of how impossible it is to imagine performance art in general in a gallery, but especially your work, because it's just constantly churning and mm. kind of reforming across the different mm. works. Yeah, that was hard to get my head around. But once I realized that Dominic Johnson had done such a beautiful job of kind of, as you say, like recuperating all these images with your help, um, and also then kind of taxonomizing the different performances and what went where, I was like, oh, I don't have to do that. Yeah. yeah. And so this book is just something different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, yeah, I think the exhibition absolutely does not feel like a kind of stale archive. And uh, just being at the opening, too, there was so much energy, <laughs> so alive. And then I felt, I, I was in the, earlier in the day, and then I was like, club vibes are coming on with the music. <laughs> and yeah, it was just, yeah the event of the season, as everyone said. Um, but back to the archive qu uh, question or issue, I wanted to ask, because both um, the way that Andy and Amelia, you were talking about archives very differently, but I can see like both of those aspects encapsulated in the Getty in a way. Mm -hmm. Like I have artist friends who've mm -hmm. worked there mm -hmm. and you know had those moments of like mm -hmm. special like 
relationships with IO's finger boxes or something like sticking my fingers in the holes. Right. And then at the same time, it feels like this kind of gate kept place where you have to put on the gloves and very serious. So I was just wondering right. if you could talk um, and Ron as well about the thought process that went into like choosing the Getty and entrusting the Getty with your materials. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they'll take care of them well. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, Ron needs a mic. Cause yeah, you need the mic. I, I mean, you'll say that I thought the one was a better place because the props could have gone with all the paperwork, but you had your own reasons. You and... um, well, the, the flat out truth is that I had an owner move in eviction, so I was becoming homeless. And John Tain was still at the Getty, so they actually arranged to give me a chunky fee. Um, and I also like not letting go of the props and costumes and having something of value for me to continue with. So, um, yeah, I, I get tired of the nonprofit world of the artist where the artist is the only one who never gets paid, especially in performance art. You're like the sideshow to every big event and you get, you know, even talks are, are the money is taken down because of academics who, who want to talk at different things. It's hard to um, make it work. And, you know, it's an institution. It's the Getty. And also I had a um, long relationship with John Tain. So, and then, of course, he left immediately after that. So <laughs> maybe I wouldn't have um, chose the Getty without John still kind of safeguarding it there. But, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a gnarly story of a period where... Um, I was either going to place it in an archive or set the, all of it on fire and tell everyone to fuck off. <laughs> and yeah, anyway, that was it. That's when, <laughs> that, that's when Paul and I went over with the truck and we're like, please don't light this on fire. We'll put this in our not temperature controlled, you know, garage and closet. I just hope that the Getty never gets wind of the fact that we don't even have AC, so. Yeah. But that was your apartment anyway, so. Yeah, the, um, some of it, you know, LA, big house is a detached garage, two bedroom house, $600 a month rent control. I could afford to just box everything and just yeah. keep pressing it back, pressing it back. Um, so some of it was just being here and here has changed to just, you know, everything goes to the highest bidder here now. There is no such thing as a neighborhood. Um, so now that's changed and I don't have to take care of that stuff. Um, and, and I'm still making a lot of work, so it doesn't, you know, yeah. it's fine. Adding to it every day. Um, <laughs> But that's, that goes to the question of, you know, what happens in cities when real estate gets priced out and whether there can be the same kind of queer communities that you see in the show. And I think clearly, no. Like, and so this city needs to get with it and find ways to support people so that they can, young people and artists and people beginning and creative careers can afford to live here because that's how all of this happened because LA was so cheap. And you know, the same, we've, we've seen it in New York. New York got priced out by the 1980s, you know? So that's a serious conversation we need to have. And that we are gonna have a panel, I think it's the last event here on queer survivance on August 31st before the show closes about this question and there's gonna be, Ron's gonna be there and some other- Surly. Yeah, getting <laughs> surly, <laughs> venting against uh, landlordism as Jack Smith <laughs> called it. Um, and yeah, some really amazing people, Madison Moore, Pony Estrange, uh, Judy Cisneros, to talk about kind of from different points of view what that means to have kind of creative queer subcultures and can we sustain that? Can we get the city to really think seriously about what it means to do that? Maybe we should, we should be getting like city officials to come in. They need to hear it. Um, anyway. Well, they will. <laughs> they just need to see this show and they'll see the light and they'll start. Anyway. 
Any more questions? Um, so I have a theory question for Amelia uh, about your book. Um, but I'm wondering what you kind of make of the way that the word performative is kind of circulating, especially when thinking about like performative activism. So thinking about like, I don't know, when the DC mayor decided to paint like Black Lives Matter in front yeah. of the White House, like things like that. How, where do you see that kind of in this genealogy that you kind of offer in your book? Well, I, I write about, I think I have a footnote where I trace it up to the moment I was finishing the manuscript, which is someone calling Trump performative, and I was like, oh, we're totally done with this word. Um, <laughs> totally done. Um, yeah, so that, again, that's the kind of thing that motivates me. I'm like, why is everybody using this word? Why has it just become this like thing that even, you know, even I lazily use to describe something? So I think, I mean, I, I stand behind Black Lives Matter 100%, and if it's mobilizing for them to think about what they do as this kind of ongoing process of, I mean, performative in its linguistic sense really just means that you're saying something that does something. So it's like a phrase like, for a justice of the peace to say, I now pronounce you uh, husband and wife is a performative because you're stating something and it's legally doing something. Mm -hmm. So it's like super narrow and very specific. But obviously it's had all this generative potential. And actually it wasn't Judith Butler who first energized it through connecting it with queer performance. It was Eve Sedgwick. So that's kind of interesting that if you look at gender trouble, Butler doesn't even use the word queer except for twice, once in a footnote, and she doesn't use the word performative. So that's kind of fascinating just to trace like, but somehow it's associated with her overall theory. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, in that case, obviously that was a moment where um, the AIDS crisis was really, at the forefront of queer theory and trying to figure out again, AIDS activism was, and Butler directly says this, was part of her articulation of that original theory. So it is connected to activism really in, in the forms that permutate up through the present day. Um, but again, I, you know, I would just say as long as it's mobilizing and energizing and not just like a journalist saying that about Black Lives Matter as a way to kind of, because sometimes it's used as a pejorative, like right. that's just exactly. performative, yeah. it's mm -hmm. not actually changing right. the world, you know, so when that happens then I say Black Lives Matter should obviously do what they need to do to put a stop to that because that's not the way in which their activism is taking place. Yeah, in a way that means the exact opposite of the original kind of intention of the yeah. word, right? Like it's like a thing that does, it's like, it's almost like glamour or something. It's like, you the know, like the, the, yeah, it's the, the effect theatrical. without the doing, yeah. you know? And, and so in some ways it's a real perverse use to call something performative as a derogatory, yeah. you know, is, is a kind of perversion actually, and not maybe a fun perversion, you know, of um, not an exciting perversion of, of performative, you know, in that way, I think. Yeah, so it's all contextual. I'd say it just matters who's saying it and what the context is. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, I just thought this was amazing, so thank you so much for like the various things. I just wanted to actually um, pick up on one point that um, um, Amelia, you were talking about, um, and I'm just interested, just like out of my own research around it, so it's like a little different from the conversation we've been having around Ron's work. It's just like you kind of talk about the like in going to New Zealand, looking at the Maori like histories, and then kind of, and then you kind of title it under this um, kind of chapter called Other, right, for yourself and. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you also talk about like your own kind of like provincialism, right? Or like, well, not your own, but like, you know, how like oh, no, artists it's perceived in the UK. <laughs> um, and, and I'm obviously like, I'm thinking about this as like someone who's like not American, right? And I think a lot about kind of 
queerness in like India or South Asia, right? Like the Hijra community and Thailand, right? Sort of, and I mean, of course, this is the same trace that kind of is going, but then I'm just interested, why do you sort of use the word othering? Mm -hmm. Or like, I mean, also as someone who's like living in empire, right? And kind of thinking of non-empire, like, could you use a better word like indigenous? Or like, okay, that's not even a good word, but like, like because, because for them or for people who are Maori or Hijras or kind of coming from these spaces, this is the other, right? Oh, and, yeah. and so what you're That's doing is you're point. actually yeah. still kind of creating a genealogy of performance that is then American or white because you're using the word. I mean, I just wonder how do you kind of grapple with that wording and that kind yeah, of making so because that, it's quite explicit, I feel like, on your part, right? That's mm -hmm. totally the point. So mm -hmm. the other chapter ends up actually being about me okay. as an other because I, that's the dislocation, you know, which is really a privilege because I can travel because I have that kind of white privilege, educational privilege. And then, you know, instead of just going there with, with this North American sense of security, it's been my experience living abroad that it's completely disorienting and terrifying. Um, not the least because when I moved to the UK, my life kind of fell apart and I ended up being a single parent. And, you know, so part of what I'm doing there is exactly that. And I don't know if you notice, Andy, can you go back to the, um, but there, no, go, yeah, the, I know yeah, sure that. You're talking about, yeah. I mean, literally, my great grandparents were missionaries in India. So that's part of what I belabor is like, how did I not like see how directly implicated I was in colonialism? I literally had to go to New Zealand, you know, like, what even is that? Like, I mean, I'm saying I'm a Catholic school in Pakistan, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's exactly that, that I was, I had to experience a disorientation and an othering. And, you know, but I'm writing the book, right? So, I mean, I still have control of the narrative. And it was quite complex and difficult to write about FAFSWAG because they wouldn't give me anything. Mm -hmm. So I actually published all of those images without getting their permission because they just, I mean, they kind of implicitly gave me permission, but, there is a long process in Aotearoa, New Zealand, of getting to know people that is required to even begin to ask to play a role or to publicly say something about the work. So in a way, this is a betrayal of that. Um, but I took the risk because it just, I couldn't like write the book without it because it so deeply changed the way I was thinking about how problematic this narrow, these narrow concepts were. Yeah. There's always this tension between the othering and the Yeah, the othering and the, yeah. Well, one of the most amazing things that I learned was there's uh, research being done in the Pacific that's writing about, instead of the endless post-colonial theory, which is still all about Europe, basically, mm -hmm. like feeling bad that they've, you know, subordinated most of the world, um, there's actually a lot of new scholarship and new theorizing that's reversing the dynamic. So it's like actually, Lee Wallace argues that Westerners invented homosexuality because they were encountering um, these kind of gender liminal figures across the Pacific. So they wouldn't have even thought of homosexuality if they hadn't had this encounter. From the get-go, I mean, you always, one in France, it was like either the Italian vice or the English vice, it's always somebody else. Always, yeah, always. <laughs> and it's like maybe it's like so cultivated in the court. You get that all over that that literature. It's, yeah, that's, that's so hilarious. So yeah, it's it's. I, and I don't think I resolved it at all. I mean, that's part of the point. Okay, is yeah, it's yeah, like it's I'm I'm much more confused than I was when I started, and I thought I'm just going to trace this discourse, and it will be very simple and straightforward. <laughs> Um, but that's probably a good place to be. I don't know, when you write a book where you end up kind of less sure 
especially if it's about queer and that kind of destabilization. I thought it was interesting that at the same, t we were in Durham at the same time. I mean, you were born there. I was born oh here in God. LA, but then I was going to an all white school in Durham and you were going to an all black school. Go figure. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if only we'd I mean, met each other, I know. you know, we could have been friends. <laughs> yeah. God, I know, that's insane. Um, yeah. And then meeting, of course, yes. I met Lisa we, through you. And yeah. So that's. Yeah, there is that kind of, you know, karma and terrain. I don't know, but it, the world, is it because I'm older that the world, and the world seems more and more interconnected and smaller. Like I keep running into people I know. Well, you go to New Zealand and there's so few people that you're bound to see someone. I, I didn't even grow up there. And like you walk down the street and it's like, oh, isn't that so-and-so from Auckland, even though I'm in Wellington? Um, that's insane. But like, yeah, it feels like you Maybe it's the art world and the academic worlds that they become these networks yeah. that become fairly... It's age. It's age. <laughs> Ron and I were born the same year, so, you know, when they, um, we like to say, you say that his strength comes from him being year of the ox. Well, I'm year of the ox, too. Ah, okay. As is Vaginal Davis, oh, as is yes. Kathy Opie. As yeah. is Barack Obama. Oh. <laughs> Crazy year, 1961. <laughs> How are we doing on time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So All I right. know there are books, and there's Ooh. is there a little bit of time in case people want to? Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much, everybody. Thank you, Andy. Ah! <laughs> <laughs>